title of my message this afternoon is All Debts Canceled. All, all, every single one. All debts, demerits, debts, sin, law breaking, all debts canceled. No longer exist. Something new has come in the place of what was old. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a remarkable um, miracle in this place today, in this house today. We have been here a while. We have been excited and learned and grown and fellowshiped and ate. And there's been many teaching sessions. And the miracle I'm asking for you right now in the name of Jesus is that every mind would be quickened, every body awakened, every spirit stirred once again so that we could hear a word from the Lord that is crucial for our health, our spiritual life, and our future. More important than the destiny of whether we'll be successful in our careers, more important than who we'll marry, the money we'll make, more important than anything is when we understand the grace of Jesus Christ. By his blood, all our debts are canceled. We are free because of what you have done for us today, Jesus. And yeah, we clap our hands, but do we really understand the depth of this, the, the breadth of this, the width of this, the height of this, that, that, that we can have joy, we can have life, we can have victory, we can overcome, we can sustain our futures, we can be faithful, we can be accountable only because you have done a work in us that we could not do in ourselves. So Lord, every mind right now, Lord, if they physically could be on the edge of the seat, put us on the edge of the seat with a fresh desire, ambition for your word to speak to us because I believe out of 40 years of preaching, I've never preached a message that has the potential for greater life transformation to set us on a trajectory of really what we're hoping for in this Spiritual Emphasis Week is freedom, freedom, freedom. And we're free from all our debts. And we thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said together, amen? amen? Amen. Stand with me if you would, please. Stand with me if you would. Now be seated. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. That's... <laughs> Trying to get a little help here with the afternoon session. All debts are canceled. To understand all debts are canceled, you have to understand two major themes in Scripture. Some of you are new to the Bible. Some of you are, have great history in the Bible. The great scholars of ancient days have told us, Martin Luther, the founder of the Reformation, particularly says, all scripture is formed in one place or another, one thought or another. It's called the law or the gospel. And he says, the man or the woman who can learn to distinguish between the law and the gospel will be the man or the woman who has a fruitful, joyful Christian life. The one who gets these two things mixed up is going to be confused the rest of their Christian life and maybe defeated, discouraged. Or if they do good with the law, they keep the law, they, God said to do it and I'm going to do it, then pride could come in. But if you get defeated by the law, oh, I tried to keep the law and I can't do it, then despair comes in. There are many in this room that are on the edge of despair. I'm trying to do all these things that they're telling me to do at this conference. In the last two sessions, you've heard, don't give up. You've heard, don't surrender. You've heard, be faithful. You heard, don't quit. And all those things are true. And all those things are good. But I want to tell you something. All those things are the law because the law tells you what you should do. You should try harder. You should be faithful. You should be good. You should work harder. You should never quit. You should never give up. You should never surrender. You should, 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 should. But if you're like me, my shoulds turn into, my should, 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 should often turns into a can't, 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 can't. Tried, 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 tried. Failed, 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 failed. And despair has hit my heart to the point of wanting to quit, not only the ministry, but my Christian faith. Because the law, the standard of the law is so high and my ability to keep it is so low. But I have some friends who keep the law. They're really good at it. 
Oh man, they, they drive 55 miles an hour if that's what the speed limit says. They, they, they do all the things we're here and we're supposed to do and they do it well. But they're breaking one law. It's called pride. I can do it. Paul called it putting confidence in the flesh. The, the law gives us a, uh, there's a danger in the law of putting confidence in the flesh. Now, I better explain to you the difference, right, between if I'm going to preach on the law and the gospel, I better explain the difference to you, right, the law and the gospel. These are two different things. And sometimes we get them confused thinking that the law is in the Old Testament. Moses and all those writers in the Old Testament, that's the law. And in the New Testament is grace or the gospel. That's not how it's broken down. There is gospel in the Old Testament. Even from the first chapters of Genesis, when Adam and Eve failed, there's a prophecy saying that the serpent would wound his heel, but he would step on the serpent's head. That's not the law. That's the gospel. The law would be more like a serpent's going to come to you and you should step on his head. That's the law. You should do this. That, and that's what we get in us. We get this gumption. We get this, I have authority. I have, man, I'm a, I'm a macho man. I can do this. And we think we're going around and stepping on the Satan's head. It doesn't say you step on Satan's head. It says he steps on Satan's head. The law says you should do this. You should be in victory. You should pray more. You should read more. You should study more. You should behave better. You should never be rebellious. You shouldn't talk back. You shouldn't have failed so many times in your past. You shouldn't have disobeyed your parents. You shouldn't have shot that heroin in your vein. You shouldn't have quit school. You shouldn't have, and you should have stayed at Teen Challenge 12 months, and you're wondering, hey, if I've been to 12 different programs for a month, does that count for a year? I, I, I should, I should, I should. And, and here's... And there's, 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 there's the gospel in the Old Testament and there's law in the New Testament. When Jesus said, a young man came to him and said, what do I do to receive eternal life? Good question. He's asking a gospel question. That what can Jesus do? What can the God do for me? It's a gospel question. And Jesus says, interesting, his answer isn't a, isn't a gospel answer. His answer is a law answer. What does the law say? Is that what Jesus responded to him? I asked a gospel question, Jesus. Why are you giving me the law? And the man said, the law is do this, 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 and that, and, and love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, do this and you'll have life. Go, go live this way. Jesus was... And this is going to sound strange to some of you, particularly some of you that have been in Scripture a little bit longer. That's the law. Jesus is putting the law out to this guy because his pride has told him he's kept all these rules. But then Jesus says the greatest of these, the greatest of the laws that you could keep is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Who in this room would have such confidence in your flesh? Who in this room would so dare to believe, I have loved God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my days, and I love my neighbor as myself until he steals my pillow. And, 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 still, and st until he gossips about me. No, not one person. Paul says it clear, there are none righteous, no, not one. You're not faithful enough. You're not, you're, you're not strong enough to not quit. You, you just can't do it in yourself. And what, the, what God gave us the law for was to show us that. Here's the list of roles. Keep those and you'll have eternal life. Keep these laws and you'll be blessed. And, and, and he gives these laws. The law, the, let me describe what the law is to you. The law is the communication of God's Concern for man, his will, his desires, his commands, his directives, his instructions, uh, his ordinances, his precepts that he gives to us. You see, the law in itself, when God gives commands, whether it be the Ten Commands or love God with your whole heart, the, 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 Paul says the law is good if it's used lawfully. So, so I'm not speaking about the law as if it's something that needs to be jettisoned and thrown out. Don't, don't keep the law. We're under grace now, so don't worry about keeping the law. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is Christianity in many circles in America has become more moralistic, law-keeping, legalistic than it has been gospel and grace-filled.
I don't know what I don't know what I should say next because I don't want to step on toes. But you know, you go into a lot of churches and they say uh, our motto is love God, love people. That's 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 the law. Oh, I walk into this church. Okay, I got two things to do. I got to try to love God. I got to try to love people. That's the law. I don't want to offend this church, but as you drive up in here, it gives you instructions. Invite people to come and serve. That's good. That's biblical. I love it. But it's the law. It's more things we're supposed to do. And, and we are surrounded to the point of exhaustion of things we could do. When I was a boy, I saw this man on a TV show, and he had, this, uh, he had, he had these poles on the stage, all across the stage, and then he got these plates off the, off the, the, the desk, and he put one on the... On the on the pole, and he began to spin it. Have you ever seen that? And the, and the, and the, and the, the plate just he stood up there, and he spun it around, and then he got a second plate, and he was telling jokes, and he was having fun, and then he put a third plate up there, and he was spinning it, and then he had a fourth plate, and you know, what, you, know, you, know, you know where the story goes, right? He had about 15 plates on the stage, and by the time he was spinning this one, the one on the other end was wobbling, and it was about to fall off. And he was running down there. And he, he stopped telling jokes. He started sweating. He was, he was like in despair. He was ready to, and all of a sudden, the plates started falling off. And he caught them all just before they crashed to the ground. That's kind of like our Christian life. We, we, we get saved at a, a, a spiritual emphasis week. And they say, just enjoy Jesus. But, but make sure you read your Bible. Okay, that's easy. I want to read my Bible. I'm hungry. For, and, and then pray and then fast, and then give and tithe, and then invite other people to church, and then make sure you're uh, living this righteous life, and then uh, don't steal, and, don't, and, and uh, you know, uh, go on mission trips. And before long, you're going like, oh, I can't even breathe anymore. I can't even speak anymore. Uh, all these plates are falling. Jesus never said, spend your life spinning plates. He said, eat of me and drink of me. In other words, turn that plate upside down. And say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, feed me. Jesus, be the thrill of my life. Jesus, be the, 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 the phrase that just rolls off my lips. Not me and my works. Not me and my efforts. Not me and my striving. Not me and what I could try to do for Jesus, but what Jesus has done for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. The Bible doesn't say, I loved him and gave myself for him. But we live that way sometimes, don't we, brothers and sisters? He loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, but, but I'm going to return the favor now. He doesn't need your favor. He doesn't need you to return the favor and try to, to, to do things for him to make him feel good. He feels good all the time. What he wants and desires for you is to turn that plate over and eat of him and drink of him and enjoy his company and his presence. And, and so the law is, is good for calling us into, to be faithful, to invite people to church, to tithe. These are all good teachings that are part of the word of God. Paul said it, as I said a moment ago, that the law is good if it's used the right way. It's, it's used to show us how once we find gospel life, it's then used to show us how to move in the realms that God gives us the grace and the empower, empowering to do those various things. The, the law is going to be, it, it didn't go away when Jesus came. He came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, there's no more Ten Commandments. You don't have to obey the law anymore. But what he did is change the trajectory of it. He changed the, the, the power because the law has a function. God gave the law, and it's good. But here's what the law is good for. It, Romans 7, 9, if you want to write that down and read it later, Romans 7, 9 says, it reveals sin. It lets you know you're a sinner. You're driving down the road, and you're going 70, and you think the speed limit's 70, and all of a sudden you look at the sign, and it says 55. It instructs you. It reveals to you the, the moral law, so to speak, the, what the code is. Not only does it reveal, but Romans 5.20 says it increases sin. How does the law increase sin? So God commands you, do not covet for me, it was when I was a young man, it was, do not lust after a woman. That's the law. And I'm thinking, don't lust after a woman. But some of them are so gorgeous, it's hard not to lust after them. Particularly that one girl in 11th grade. I'm in 10th grade, and she's at 11. She's blonde, and she, man, she's built like a house, you know. And I just, <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I, I just heard the law. Don't lust after a woman. And, and the very law itself increased my sin. 
What, why? And, and Paul later on asked this question, why then the law? Galatians chapter three, why the law? Because it increases sin. And then he goes on to say in Romans chapter three, verse 19, because it shuts your mouth. That's what, that's what he says, shuts your mouth. It, 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 it ends boasting. It ends the pride saying, I'm gonna be faithful. I'm gonna be a never quitter. I'm gonna do this perfectly this time. I'll never fail God again. As soon as you say, I'll never fail God again, you just failed him because you told a lie. It, it ends boasting. Oh, but there's hope. There's hope. One writer says, the law shows the disease, the gospel shows the cure. The law says you must do this, and if you do not do this, you have no recourse. There is no appeal to a magistrate. You will, not be, you will be accursed. You will be condemned. You will be pronounced guilty. You will be cursed. You will be judged. You will be punished. You will end up in hell. That's what the law says. But the law is doing its good work when that drives you to Christ. When you finally in despair saying, I have nowhere else to turn. I can't do this in my own strength. I no longer have any confidence in my flesh. My promises are no good anymore. My commitments to never do it again, to go back again to the world. My commitments have failed me. Nothing in my hand I bring to the cross, but simply to him I cling. The law does nothing else but to expose our sin, to intimidate and to humble us, says Martin Luther. Oh, but look at the contrast between the law and the gospel. The law tells us what to do. The gospel tells us what Christ has done. There's no such instruction of, of the law telling us what to do. There's no such instruction contained in the gospel, but rather it only reveals what God has done and is doing for you and I. Isn't that powerful? As soon as you hear instruction, do this, try that, you're not hearing something bad. You're hearing something you should do. It's called the law, and, and we're, we, we are still, Paul, Paul talked about the law of Christ, and, and, and he wanted to live the law of Christ. He obeyed the Ten Commandments, but he understood that when he heard the gospel, there was no instruction to it. It wasn't do this and you'll live. It was Christ lived for you and died for you, and now you'll live in him. The law speaks concerning our works. The gospel can, speaks concerning the works of Christ. The law says that... The law says, thou shalt, and the gospel has no other single demands, attachments, or requirements other than putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The law tells us what to do, but offers us no enabling powers or benefits. It uncovers our sin, but gives us no help, no hope, hurling us into despair. The law does not produce contrition. It does, it, 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 but it conjures up terrors of condemnation, judgment, and hell. And again, these things sound bad, but every single one of those things are the things that have caused you to come to Christ. It's, it's, his, it's, it's the loving squeeze of a father. It's him wrapping his arms around you until it's painful, saying, stop, my son. Stop, my daughter. Don't try to do this in your own strength. Lean on me, come to me, trust in me, put your hope in me. There's no hope in the confidence of your own flesh. The law commands and demands, but what it can't do is justify you. The word justify is making you in right relationship with God. Where you stand before him one day, you're going to stand before him as holy and just and righteous, and the law can't do that. It shows you you can't do that so that it causes you to say, I, I think I need to be justified, made right by Jesus' work for me, by the blood of the cross. The, the gospel provides righteousness the gospel provides the glory of God. It pro produces blessing and, and glory in our life and justification. There's a passage of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter, and, and this one blows me away. It's, it's a frightening scripture. It's Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Deuteronomy 28 and 29. It's called the laws of blessings and the laws of curses. And we love the laws of blessings in the, in the next chapter. You're going to be blessed when you go out. You're going to be blessed when you come in. You're going to be blessed in your prosperity. You're going to be blessed with children. You're going to be blessed with health. You're going to be blessed with prosperity. You're going to be blessed with a good mind. But if you break the law, and, 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 and in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, it goes on to say what these laws are. And it says, and if you break these laws, cursed will you be. And these curses, if you want to read this, this is bad. You're going to have mildew on your body. I don't even know what that is. You're, all your sheep are going to die. Now, and most of you don't have sheep, but basically that's speaking of your business 
Your, your family will fall apart if you don't obey the law. And, and so Moses got up in front of the people in Deuteronomy and, and he says, I'm gonna tell you the law and when I'm done telling you the law, you say this after every law I tell you, amen, so be it. And basically what they were saying by their amen is if, and later on they actually said this, if we don't do what we promise, all that's in the law, let those curses fall upon us. Can you imagine being there and Moses says, if you look upon a woman with lust, or if you commit adultery, or, or if you get angry at your neighbor, uh, if you steal, if you steal, let this curse be upon you. Amen, so be it, Lord. Let that curse be upon me. If I was in that place, I'd be saying, slow down a little bit. We'll take a moment here. Let's think about this. He just said, if, 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 if I go after that girl, curses will be upon me. My children, my family, my finance, my health. My, it says my mind will be confused to the point of almost like having a mental breakdown. These are the curses of the law. And, and these, can I just call them idiots? Or stand and say, I'll do that one. Sign me up for that one, yeah. I, I, I'll never smoke a cigarette again, I promise. And if I do, just curse me, God. That's how much confidence I have in my flesh. If I was there, I'd say, help me, Lord Jesus. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't, I can't, I can't stop looking. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop uh, being selfish. I can't stop being angry. I can't, uh, just don't put me under these curses because I can't do it. We're gonna hear in just a few minutes what happened to that curse. Is that interesting to you? See, because you promised already. Anybody ever made some promises? that you failed, okay, Deuteronomy 28 says you're under a curse then. Family, health, sight, mind. What, what's gonna happen to those curses? I'm gonna tell you in just a moment. Israel thought they could do it in their own strength and God showed them the truth. You see I have a whiteboard up here because I wanna try to show you something. Here's a, uh, there's, there's kind of two boxes in our life. I'm not sure you can see this, all right? D-E-B, debts and merits. Can you guys see that okay? It looks pretty good on the screen, right? Okay, uh, debts. Anybody have any debts or demerits or things like that? Okay, um, we heard today, be faithful. Anybody ever been unfaithful? Okay, that's... More than once? Okay, well, let's, let's go and put two up there for that one. Anybody, the, the, the Bible says, Jesus said, don't lust after, uh, we'll use man or woman here, anybody, and don't have to say this too loud, okay, so your counselor doesn't come and talk to you after the session, but <laughs> anybody want to just whisper out yes and amen, there's some lust, uh-oh, we got some debts, and, and anger, and selfishness, and pride, and ambition, and stealing, and maybe even murder, and and unkindness, and, uh, and, and, and if you don't have any of those, how many of you in this room love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself perfectly? If, if you didn't do that, that's, that's a debt. Matter of fact, that's a big debt. That's the biggest debt of all, it really is, because all these other debts come from that one, because I didn't love God. All right, merits. Um, and here's what we try to do. It's like, man, I got all these debts. I got all these marks against me. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Teen Challenge. That's going to help me. And, and when I go there, I'm going to go to chapel. And when I go to chapel, they're going to give me a Bible. I'm going to read my Bible. And they, 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 they taught me a couple prayers. I'm going to say some prayers. And well, it's still not measuring up. I'm still not, I'm not sure I'm there yet. I'm not sure I'm out of the curse yet. And so, so I'll, I'll pray a little more and I'll fast a little more and I'll try a little harder and I'll, I'll give my clothes away to the poor and I'll do all, all good things. The law tells us to do those things. But here's the difference between law and gospel. The law tells us what is good, but the law never justifies us. You cannot be justified by works of the law. That's what Paul said. This will never, this will never make up for that. Are you, are, are you following me so far? You can't balance the scale. As a matter of fact, let me go one step further. When you try to do these merits, do you know what, you know what Paul says about are works of righteousness. Can anybody guess what they are? Yeah, oh, you guys are scholars. So if my, if my good works are filthy rags, does it even show up on our merit? 
Where does it show up? Under your, yeah, you're tracking the debt. I, I prayed more. I fasted more. I read my Bible more. If it's self-righteous effort of the law, you're just making yourself worse off. Now, that's, now that sounds harsh to you. I know that. That sounds almost like, but, but that's law doing its work. It's doing its work because some of you are already feeling it now. What do I do then? I'm in despair. The law is supposed to make you feel this despair. It's, it's not a balancing act. It, it's, it's, there's nothing you can do in your own strength. There's no righteousness. There's no works of the law that can cause you to do this. And the, another problem is not just that you have these particular particular debts. This is what I was trying to teach to you yesterday. It's not just that you committed certain sins where there's debts, but, but you are totally a sinner. It, it's, it's your nature. It's, it's, it's not just something you did. It's, it's who you are. So, so how are you going to make up for that? Okay, it's kind of like this. Um, uh, guy's driving down the road. He's going 55 and a 55 speed limit. He's using his turn signals. Cop pulls him over. And the driver says, man, why'd you pull me over? I obeyed every law. And he looks at the kid's ID, and the policeman says, I pulled you over because you're nine years old. <laughs> and your, your, your student ID says you're nine years old. You're not just breaking speed limit laws or turn signal laws or going too slow in the fast lane laws. You are a lawbreaker. Just by your very nature, you have broken the law of the land, and we have broken the law of God. And so... This is called being under the, I got 11 minutes. This is called being under the headship of Adam. Romans chapter 5 says, in Adam, or under Adam, because Adam sinned, he's our spiritual father, or our, our headship father. It's like a, the tree, he's the root, and we grew up as the branches. And so all of us have that Adamic, it's called the Adamic nature. We're all like that. Are you guys okay? Uh, if I'm getting a little too crazy here, I'll just, just tell me to stop. So, so we're all kind of stuck in this Adamic nature, and, and what we need is something beyond our own ability, and what is called there is called the substitutionary atonement. Write that down, please, the substitutionary atonement, because this is where the gospel comes in. So far I've been teaching the law, now I'm going to show you the gospel. Substitutionary atonement does this amazing thing, and let me just show you this. What it, what it does, here's all our debts. We don't have any merits. Jesus lived a perfect life. This was completely full of merit. No, and no, how many debits did Jesus have or debts? Zero, all right? Here's the gospel. Instead of trying to get enough merits to get rid of the debts in our life and be acceptable to God, Jesus said, the law shows you you can't do it, but I want to show you how you can get out of the curse and find life and acceptable nature to God. And here's what it is. Jesus said, I will take all of your debts and I will, and I'll put them, you know where I'm going? I'll put all your debts in my column. Okay, all, 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 all of all of your debts are no longer there. Mm. He took them all away, my friends. Man. He said, and he said to you, and he said to you, and he said to me, this most powerful phrase that I love, my friend, my son, my daughter, all debts canceled. All debts canceled. So, so, so now God looks here and says, hmm, all debt's canceled, but you're still not righteous. Uh, it's, it's, I said this yesterday. It's, it's beautiful that he forgives all our sins, but you can't get into heaven just because you don't have any sin. You can only get into heaven if you're perfectly righteous before God, if you kept the law perfectly. From Genesis to Revelation, there's no lessening of the requirements of keeping the law. God didn't say, ah, oh, these poor people can't keep the law. Let me compromise with them. 
just keep portions of the law. No, we still have to keep the total law of God, the whole moral law of God. But the problem that God sees in us is we're incap incapable of doing that. All our debts are canceled, but yet we're still not standing holy and pure before God. So not only is all of our debt put upon Christ, you know what Christ does? He says, I'm going to put all of my righteousness into you. So, you, so now you have... Now you have this beautiful, it's called the double cure. He cured me of all my debts, and yet I was missing the merits to go to heaven and be right with God and feel peace and joy and contentment and no longer feeling under condemnation or guilt and shame or no longer having to strive for more merits. But now Christ has put all of his merits of complete obedience to the law. He loved God with all his heart, heart, soul, mind. He loved his neighbor as himself. He never lusted after a woman. He never committed murder or angry at his brothers or sisters perfectly. And now he puts that into us. And so when God sees us, he goes, look at this person. He no longer has any debts and he has the full righteousness of God in Christ. This is where the old hymn, you may not have ever heard this. Some of you that are older may have heard this. My favorite hymn by far. Would you mind listening to the words of this with me? Rock of ages. I hope I get through this without crying because this really touches my heart for what Jesus has done for us. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and your blood from your wounded side which flow be of sin, the double cure, saved from wrath for my sins and made pure. The, the writer of this psalm, the song knows it so well. It's called the double cure. Saved from wrath and make me pure. How? Verse two, not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. I can't do it with my own hands, is what he's saying. Could my zeal with respite? No. And without, you know what he's saying there? Could my zeal without ever ceasing? Could my effort without ever stopping, could, could my zeal, no respite, no, could my tears forever flow? Could my, could my emotion take care of this problem I have? All for sin could not atone. Your emotion can't atone. Your willpower can't atone. All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone, Jesus alone is the cure for our sin, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked I come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul, speaking of himself, foul I come to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, mine eyes shall close in final death. When I soar to worlds unknown, see thee at thy judgment throne, rock of ages, Clef, in other words, hide me. Hide me in this righteousness of Christ. Don't judge me based on my own merits because I have nothing righteous in myself. Don't judge me in my past sins because there's too many for it to be dealt with. Wash them all away. Cleanse me by your righteousness and put your, your goodness in me. Hide me in the cleft. Let me hide myself in thee. I heard an old preacher tell a, a story he just was imagining one day. Do you remember in the Gospels where it tells about Jesus on the cross and who was on their sides? Two different thieves, lawbreakers. I mean, they broke all the laws. They were, they were up there not because of good they had done, the lawbreakers. And to the one man on one side, he, he rejects all this, don't want anything to do with it. The, the other man on, the, on his left, so to speak, turns and just says, this man was innocent. He, he, he understands it. it's nothing he did. How, how, did, how did he get saved? He, he got saved instantaneously. How did he get saved? In an instant, just by saying, this man is innocent, Jesus cleansed him from his sin and, and put his righteousness into him. Now, hold on a second. Hold on. This man, now, in the story, he goes up to heaven. All right, he's a thief. He's a murderer. He's an adulterer. He's a child abandoner. And, he, and all of a sudden, he's, he just died. His breath is, the last thing he heard is, today you'll be with me in paradise. Does he, he doesn't even probably know what paradise is. But all of a sudden, he's standing at the gates of heaven. And the angels are there saying, who are you? And he says, I'm the guy on the cross. Why are you here? I don't know. Um, well, did you understand what Pastor Gary was saying about substitutionary atonement? 
I don't know what substitutionary atonement is. I'm sorry. But do you know about the righteousness that comes through Christ alone? And I don't really know what Christ's righteousness really is. And the angel says, well, what are you doing here? And the man says, I don't know, but he told me I could come. He just, the man on the cross said I could come. He, I don't really understand all this, but, but, but he did something for me that I couldn't even, I couldn't do for myself. And maybe I couldn't even understand it for myself. And I, in my picture, I kind of take this analogy a little further. I, I picture the angel coming with his chart and saying, um, uh, brother, I, I know you're standing here, but <laughs> I have a long list. I have uh, 418 pages of, of, of debts against you. And he goes, well, I, I have no idea how I got in. And, and, and over here, I, he said, and you have no merits of your own. So, so you, you have debts, and all of a sudden I picture a voice coming from behind them all, the angels and this man, and it's Jesus. And all of a sudden he's running towards this man and the angels, and he's saying, all debts canceled. I canceled all those debts. They're gone. I, I've given him, well, okay, Jesus, that was a good work you did. That's so gracious. I knew you were gracious, so all his debts are canceled, but he can't get into heaven because he's not righteous. Oh, all the righteous deeds that I've ever done, put that in his column for me. Give, give him my report card. And, and so, not just when you're in heaven standing at the gates, but right now, as you give your life to Jesus Christ, not by your works, your effort, your confidence, optimism in the flesh, you just saying, Jesus, I trust you to do this substitutionary work in my life. Take away my debts and Put in me your righteousness. And that means right now you are standing. When God looks at you, when Jesus looks at you, when the Holy Spirit looks at you, when the angels look at you, they say, perfectly righteous. Uh, he, he, he loves, she loves God with all her heart. Not in her own optimistic strength, but in what Christ has done for her. Uh, look, uh, see, you'll, you'll want to keep looking at your sin. Uh, I feel like I, as a father, I failed my kids a lot. You know, and some of them turn into some pretty bad things, and I, and I, and I blame myself. And so I, so I put merits, excuse me, I put debts, de debits, debts in my thing. I could have been a better father, then my, my kids would not gone on to drugs. And when Jesus taught me this, you know what he taught me? That, that you don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in condemnation. You don't have to try to make up for it now. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do better as a father. You don't have to try hard to be better as a father. Just believe in Jesus. Trust him because grace, the gospel gives you power to do everything you want to merit to do. But your own strength won't do it. But now the gospel comes along and it gives you the power to obey the law. Not like I'm gonna try hard to obey the law but now I want to. This is what the New Testament covenant is all about. It says he takes out the laws that were written on stone, and where does he write them? On our hearts. So in your heart now is the law of God. I'm not trying to merit acceptable behavior before God. I, I am enjoying God so much, acceptable behavior is my delight. I, I love to love people. I love to love God. I love to pray. I love to read my Bible. I love to fast. I love to give. All debts canceled. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you believe that.